Um, okay, I'll start. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'll start introducing myself. So, my name is Brian Vasquez. I'm a software engineer at Google and I work in the kernel networking team. And today I'm going to talk about how to do dynamic encapsulation using DPF. So, let's get started. Uh, this is the agenda for today. First, I'll talk about the motivation and how this uh, dynamic encapsulation was first implemented in the kernel, then how we uh, BPFI the solution. And also I'll, I'm going to talk about uh, how we extended the BPF solution to do encapsulation header reflection. Uh, and during the talk, uh, I'll introduce some challenges that we faced. Um, so uh, to make more interactive and feel free to interrupt and ask any question at any time. Um, so let's get started. So the motivation. So motivation um, was to do traffic engineering and the goal was, or the requirement was to forward traffic via specific routes. And the main point here is that this, uh, these routes could change in the middle of a connection. And this uh, was like really long time ago. So I also want to point out that uh, when everything, when this started, like uh, it was prior to lightweight tunnels. So the only approach at that time to having these special routes uh, to direct traffic was setting up uh, multiple tunnel devices. And the problem is that uh, doing traffic engineering using tunnel devices required root permission and configuring uh, hundreds of devices that uh, would have impacted the performance of the system. So we wanted to design uh, an application or a feature in, in the kernel, and we wanted to achieve the, these three goals. So the first one was to allow um, privileged applications to pick the exit point without having to create tunnel devices, and this was to cover the performance issue. And when I said in privileged application, it's not really that they are unprivileged, but uh, so we do have some uh, per C group level control. But the idea is that uh, once we have a host, we don't want uh, users to change the configuration. We want to know what it is at every point in the time. So uh, that was the reason. Uh, the other requirement was to allow each connection to be encapsulated to a different destination. And this was the initial requirement, but later we also extended to change different protocols as well. Uh, and the third requirement was to allow the exit point uh, to change in the middle of a connection. So now let's move to how it was implemented in the kernel. So this was also before BPF uh, was popular and was that powerful. Uh, so just to keep that in mind. And the way that we implemented it, it was using internal patches uh, that we apply on top of the IP tunnel device. And what we did was uh, to add a per socket state where basically we indicated uh, what were the destination gateway or we, we kind of cheat and change the protocol headers uh, for the encapsulation in case we, we needed it. And the way users populated this information was uh, using set socket options at the IP level. And so basically that was how we populated this per socket state. And uh, we started with only one uh, set socket option that we created internally, that it was encap gateway, but later we exchanged it to, to do different encapsulation headers. So this is only like historical reason why we have two uh, set socket instead of one. Uh, and we keep that implementation. So now that I talk a little bit how it was implemented, uh, I also want to talk about uh, the host configuration because it's also important. Because as soon as we started to add uh, these encapsulation headers and change and use different protocols, uh, the, the length of the packets change depending on what the application is using at that specific point in time. So what we wanted to do is uh, we want to do MSS clamping or MTU clamping to make sure that the packets uh, are going to fit the MTU before they leave the host and after the encapsulation headers are added. So how we did it, uh, we use basically a special mark to distinguish the standard routing table and the special routing. Uh, so we could uh, force this special traffic to leave the host using a different device 
and different table and different routes. So here I have an example uh, of basically one of the rules that uh, the, that I use uh, just to explain this point. Uh, so we are saying that all the packets that are uh, set with this mark will go to table uh, 1000 and this table 1000 is using this Donnell device uh, where we apply the logic to it. And basically we are uh, uh, clamping the MTU and the MSS. And here are little explanations, but this is just an example and it's just to show you what you need to consider when, when doing this. And so now that you have an idea of how it was done in kernel, I want to introduce the first challenge because this challenge is not only for the kernel, but uh, it's also present in the in the BPF implementation. And is that uh, when we change the routing uh, based on certain actions, for example, we can set the we can set the mark or the toss for a socket. And this we this could cause different routing policies, right? So as I told you, the one of the requirements for this dynamic encapsulation was that uh, the connection can change the, in the middle. Uh, so this means that we need different MSS. And the problem is that uh, the MSS is cached. So basically, uh, packets uh, can be mal uh, malformed because of this. And this was solved with an internal patch that uh, uh, I have plans to send upstream. And basically the idea is that uh, during these uh, sets of options, the ones that could cause the routing uh, policies to change, uh, we plan to call also this function which basically resets the, the DST uh, and also like uh, reveals the, the header and also tries to update the MTU in case uh, of the the new route is uh, using a different MTU. Um, so now uh, let's talk about how we implemented this solution in BPF. And I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with BPF, so you all know what are the benefits of doing this in BPF. But still, I will mention that we wanted to get rid of these custom patches that we have in the turn in the kernel and that we're clearly no candidates for upstream work. So of course we went and implemented this in BPF. Um, before I uh, dive in into how we did it, I want to compare two different solutions uh, because in BPF we have two different hooks, uh, the lightweight tunnels and the TC hook. And I just want to make uh, some quick comparison between them. And the first one is that uh, lightweight tunnels attaches to routers and TC attaches to QDs. And this is important because um, these two hooks are in two different parts of the networking stack, which means that uh, you don't have the same access uh, uh, depending on which one you decide to run and you are restricted. Uh, so basically, it was important for the decision, the decision uh, we made. And another point is that both run before software segmentation. And I know that this point is not clear right now, but I explain later why it matters. And as I stated before, uh, L a lightweight tunnels was more restricted in terms of reading and writing fields and BPF helpers. And also some features, for example, lightweight tunnels don't have access to SK local storage. Um, so I'm not saying that lightweight tunnels, uh, lightweight tunnels could have been used if, uh, of course, it would mean more work for us. So we decided to use TC based on available BPF helpers and because we already have programs uh, running in the TC hook and for us it was easy just to extend those programs and take advantage of the current infrastructure. So now let's move about uh, how it was designed. Uh, and it was pretty similar to the internal implementation. So we have a socket data uh, that lucky us, we have the local storage map available. So all the handling, it's transparently done for us. And what we store in this data, uh, in, this, in this map, sorry, is the encapsulation data. Uh, so I'm mentioning here just the BPF being destination. Uh, but you can, I'm not showing this structure here, but you can think of this structure as basically a way to write certain IP, RR, uh, headers uh, information like destination or source address. 
And also you can include the encapsulation headers, for example, UDP, if you want to do uh, some custom encapsulation, so not necessarily GRE. And the idea of the design was to uh, have similar implementation to the previous, uh, to, to the internal dealing cap that we did. So it was pretty, uh, it was straightforward to do in the sense that we already used these sets of options that I told you before. And, and what we are doing is capturing these uh, sets of calls and uh, storing the, the, the encapsulation headers that the user is providing us and store it in the SK local storage. So here's an example of how we are changing the destination. So uh, basically we are creating the uh, local storage. Uh, we are copying the, the op value, which for this example contains a new destination address. And it's still important that we distinguish these packets that are being encapsulated. So we set a, a special mark. And also important to note is that uh, when we switch to this implementation, the actually the set of option that we are capturing doesn't exist in kernel. So we, that's why we are returning a minus one because we are bypassing, bypassing the kernel. We don't want this call to go to the kernel. And so this was one part of the of the problem, which is the control path. And the other one is the data path. And the data path is uh, basically where we read the encapsulation data at the TC Grace hook, and we modify the packet. So I'm just showing you here how more or less uh, the code uh, should look like, but it's just an example. So what we are doing is you, we, are, we are just uh, reading the, the local storage and we are a loading a certain information from the packet so we can reuse some some of it and we are also adding the room the room for the encapsulation headers and we are storing it so basically uh, uh, this is how it was done and here i want to stop and also explain something uh, that it was a goal when we moved to ebpf and it was that uh, we wanted to do this without a tunnel device and actually it worked pretty well until we discover uh, the next challenge. And the next challenge is that uh, neither TSO or GSO understand custom or multiple levels of encapsulation. And the problem is that packets need to fit the MTU after encapsulation headers are added. And the real issue here was that the, we don't have a, in BPF TC hooks that run after software segmentation. So what happened is that we were adding a encapsulation headers here, but uh, there, there wasn't a way uh, where GSO could understand this. So the way we fix it uh, was uh, not straightforward and it was interesting. So we ended up adding back the tunnel device and we added the tunnel device back because by disabling the the TSO in the tunnel device, we can for the, the packet will traverse the network stack twice so we can force the first uh, time to execute the, the software segmentation. And then we attach in, in, the, in, the, in the physical interface, the next hook uh, to modify the headers. And this is a little bit tricky because what this means is that uh, the packet that we modified, it's already been encapsulated. Uh, so you just need to be careful on on how you do it, because you need to change the protocol, uh, or you or you need to add certain room, but you need to consider that uh, it already had some kind of encapsulation. And so now that you have an idea of how this was done in BPF, I want to talk about a, a feature that it was interesting as well, and it's reflection. So what's reflection? In the past, uh, we have implemented different uh, reflection features. For example, one of is the TOS reflection. And I'll talk a little bit for the TOS reflection. So the idea here is that the client uh, has certain TOS when, uh, when it sends the same packet to the server and the server should reply back with the same uh, TOS. So it, it, it maintains the same, the same quality service. Uh, so here the idea is pretty similar and thanks to eBPF doing it, it, it was actually possible. So the objective was the same, like as part of the traffic engineering, sometimes uh, packets need to traverse along the same path. 
And these packets sometimes need or additional metadata, and it could be, for example, a, a virtual network ID. And something important is that most of the times, this NCAP data is not relevant for the application that is, a serve, uh, that is serving uh, the traffic. So they don't need to be aware of this overlay network or these encapsulation headers. So how we do it, uh, how we extended the NCAP uh, to add this reflection feature, so it was still using the DNN cap, so we could reuse it completely. And the difference is how we populate the, the BPF map, which is the SK local storage. So uh, basically, we were using set socop option, so users could specify the encapsulation headers. But uh, for reflection, we want to store the data for incoming connections. So what we did here is to use the C group SKB ingress hook. And that was where we, where we captured the data. Uh, so to so to give you an idea, this is how it looks like. Um, this is a program that we are running to the SKB ingress. And what we are doing is uh, we are loading the bytes, uh, but we want to start at the at the MAC header because when the hook the C group ingress hook runs when the packet uh, has already made it to the socket. So. This means that the first encapsulation header uh, was removed and it was able to, to be received in the application. So here, basically, we load uh, at the MAC to get the encapsulation header that was removed because we still have it in the SKB. And basically, what we use is to try to compare the, the, the length of the outer header, that it could be an inner header. And based on that, we, we know if the packet was encapsulated or not and we store the data in the local storage. So this is more or less also an example of how if we store the data. In this case, I'm just storing the destination and source address in the, this, the SK local storage, which is the best, but for sure we put it DD, so that's fine. And everything worked well, but also there was another challenge that it was not obvious. and. Uh, we miss it in the original design. Um, so the next challenge is basically that SK storage is not available for listener sockets because you are working with the request socket, which is a, a lightweight version. So this actually was a, an interesting problem because what this, uh, what this means is that the first assumption that we did that we could handle this uh, more or less transparently uh, didn't work for just the SIM packet, which was unfortunate. Uh, so how we solve this, we had to add a global BPF map, uh, which is uh, it's not the SK local storage. So we have a different map and we use the file tuple as a key. So we consider source, destination, and ports and protocol to store the encapsulation header for that protocol. And as soon as the connection is established, uh, we basically move that entry to the SK local storage and we remove it for the global map. So of course the global map is temporary. So we decided to use the LRU hash. And something important to mention here is that uh, we also wanted to isolate this global map because in case that we have a sim flood, uh, we don't want a uh, yes, we don't want to compromise all the applications that are using encapsulation headers reflection. So we isolate this map and we are uh, loading this map. Uh, per C group. So each user has its own view. So if there's an async flood, only one user is compromised. Um, so this is more or less the problem. This was actually really interesting. And I'm actually really curious if someone in the community has faced similar issues with the uh, storage and how to solve it or how, how, how it was solved in, in your case. And now I'm and basically going to the last part of the presentation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what were the conclusions. And the first one is that BP5 and DNN cap solved the goals that were initially set. So this was really nice. And the reflection features uh, that came after, it was a requirement uh, that it was also easily extended in some sense, uh, except, for, except just for the inconvenience of the local storage. So uh, again, BPF is powerful and it's nice, and this allows us to, to move this uh, logic that was uh, 
uh, quite complex and it was in, invasive because we have this feature in some sims similar and it was implemented in the kernel so that was nice and what went wrong it's not really that it went wrong but it was surprising and so basically modifying packets in the middle of the connection uncover unexpected issues like the mss that is cached or the fact that if you want to do custom encapsulation headers or multiple layers uh, you still need to go to gso and gso doesn't understand that so we need to add it like an extra device just to work around that and the local storage issue was as, uh, as well and also in general uh, i would say that B bpf is really nice and it's powerful but it's also uh, quite complex because uh, in each hook you need to basically know uh, in which part of the stack it is and what you have access to and what are the expectations uh, and also I want to conclude with some nice to have uh, that would make uh, our life much easier when we were doing this. And the first one is uh, SK local storage for listener sockets. I'm aware that uh, this is not done because the so uh, local storage needs a lock and the request socket doesn't uh, use a lock, but could we have like some light version of it or it, would it be possible? Uh, the next point is uh, a tunnel device. Uh, could we have like a tunnel device that doesn't add headers? So it's more like in a programmatic way, it allows you to do whatever you want and it avoids, it avoids the issue of USO. And this one uh, probably wasn't obvious because uh, we changed the implementation from uh, not having tunnels to adding a tunnel device, but <clears throat> basically, when you don't have a tunnel device and you want to modify the, the packet, you want to add the source IP. And the source IP usually is a device that is in certain namespace. So this data is per namespace. And there are a, a lot of configurations where we have a, a namespaces a, and multiple C groups, a, multiple applications with different C groups are using the same namespace. So I think that it would be really useful at some point to maybe have a, a namespace storage. And last but not least, I want to thank uh, to my coworkers who were key contributors of this work. So thanks Coco, Mahesh, Stan, and William uh, for contributing in this project as well. Um, thank you for listening. Um, with this, uh, uh, I hit the end of the talk. So I'm ready for open discussions or any question that you may have. Thanks a lot for your talk, Brian. And hopefully my echo is also fixed. Um, does anyone have questions or feedback or similar issues that you faced and solved it differently, for example. So uh, just regarding the uh, local storage for the listener socket, uh, Martin is an expert here, so I think he's trying to connect. Uh, he's saying actually that the listener socket is a full socket, so it should, like if it doesn't work, there is a bug, so it should be available. Like on a request socket, not, but listener socket supposed to be the full sock. So maybe it's just like extra. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what went wrong there. Like in where you have this pointer to socket that it doesn't have it. So we probably should debug it offline, but it should work. But I will let Martin come in. If I recall correctly, the problem is with the first scene packet. Because the first SIM packet uh, only has access to the request uh, socket. Uh, so that doesn't have the SK local storage available. So we need this global map uh, and this workaround only to reply uh, for the CNAC. Um, I, I had another question, so maybe 
I mean, if Martin is connecting later and he has a comment, you can just jump in. Uh, I had a question regarding um, this dummy tunnel device. Did, um, do you see ways where we could achieve the same without having an extra device that we would need to allocate just for this? I mean, I would assume maybe like on a node, there are different use cases, different or potentially encapsulation with different header lengths or so. So you probably don't want to add several uh, tunnel devices that you would need for this. Um, do you see options where we could or like where BPF could just encode this into the SKB, for example. <clears throat> so uh, also, like if I recall correctly, the, uh, the there are certain flags that uh, that could be used for this GSO uh, in actually in the BPF helpers. But uh, still, I think that they don't understand, for example, if you have uh, multiple layers of encapsulation. So imagine that you have GRE with uh, multiple MPLS lab labels. So this is where it gets tricky. And, and yes, probably I need to look more into this problem. And yes, it could be maybe solved without a dummy device. This was a way. Unfortunately, we discovered uh, this issue like pretty late in the development process. So we just find how to work around it as soon as possible. And it was adding this device to have the software segmentation. But yes, it, it could be interesting if this could be done without the tunnel device. Um, yes, sir. Related to that, we basically disable GSO and TSO. Um, it would be ideal if we don't have to do that, if we can rely on something like GSO partial mm -hmm. to just pass these packets, regardless of headers to the NIC. Um, but another issue is that this BPF program runs before segmentation, also before the QDisk. So other, other programs that do uh, accounting of bytes on the wire also have the issue that if you run it in a BPF program before the QDisk, there might be drops that are incorrectly not accounted. So the other option would be essentially a BPF hook after um, this processing, after QDisk layer, after um, validate uh, SKB XMIT, validate XMIT SKB. Um, and essentially what we do by introducing a dummy device, because we don't really use the tunnel device as a tunnel, is, is to get that extra BPF hook. I assume that the accounting problem yeah. uh, has come up for others as well, where you kind of miss accounts, uh, packets and bytes on the wire if you do accounting in BPF on a device. Okay, I see M Martin raised his hand, so uh, please pick up. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I try to start my cam, but it doesn't work. So, yeah. so uh, is it something that I can answer or? Sorry, John Nate. Yeah, yeah so there, there was uh, basically a question regarding the local storage that was implemented for sockets. And it's that uh, basically when you have a TCP connection and you are receiving the first SIM packet for an incoming connection, you are working with that request uh, socket. So the request socket, if I recall correctly, doesn't have, for example, a lock that was required for the SK local storage. So my understanding, and I believe uh, that we tried it in the implementation, is that for this initial SIM packet, there's no way that we can use SK local storage. So I don't know if you have like comments on that and, and maybe a, a, you, you've seen this problem or have ideas of how to work around it or, or if it would be possible to extend uh, the, the SK local storage. Right, uh, no, yeah, you're right. The local storage is not available to the request socket, right? So right now it's only implemented for all full socket, like TCP socket, UDP socket, or listening socket, but not the mini socket, like request socket. Uh, why it's not there? Because uh, 
I don't have a use case for that. <laughs> it's not nothing that we cannot add to it. Um, um, but we, I don't have a use case. It's like the request of it is like uh, it's not it's not like a permanent socket. Right? When a full when a when a full established socket is created, we request socket pretty much will be gone. Right. So so the use case is our current use case is like. Uh, store something in socket, store something in the socket there, and then use it for a long time. So, so request sort of just doesn't fit the use case that we have. But I can imagine um, that a case may come up like we, we want to save something in the request socket uh, because, for example, you learn something from the same packet. I, I guess you learn something from the same packet, and then you want to store something there. Yeah. Um, that that makes sense. Um, but somehow, so far, we get around it um, by saving the whole same packet uh, per se, and then uh, and then we there's a socket option called save sync. Something says like save sync, right? There's a socket option to do that. So we save the whole same packet, and then later when the when the whole socket established, then we we can. We can we learn from the uh, same packet that we saved it. Um, is this is it is it this is it your use case that you want to save something from the same packet? That's why you want to create a local so storage in a request socket. Yes. So so the idea of this work is that uh, we want the same packet comes with encapsulation headers. So what we wanted to do is to add these encapsulation headers in this a request socket or SK local storage. And we wanted to reply back uh, and use the same information that we store. So we add the encapsulation headers back. But we wanted to do it in a way that the user doesn't need to interact with, uh, with, uh, with it. So the user wouldn't call to this uh, safe CNAC or wouldn't set the, this metadata uh, when it's established. We wanted to do it in a transparent way for the application. So we ended up like using a global map to store this uh, temporal state. And, and once the connection is established, we detect that and we move just the entry from this global map to the SK local storage. So I guess that uh, the suggestion uh, or the approach that you were suggesting, it, it's pretty similar to what we did, just that we did it in, inside the BPF and without like calling the sets of options, but by using this global map. Yeah, why now we save it? Why now we call? We do, why now we don't require the user to call sensor up also? We we do it in the BPF program. So we enforce the safe sync, safe sync sensor up. So that's how we do it without asking the uh, user application to set to call sensor up. The BPF program itself calls sensor up. Um, but how do you guys? Solve the um oh but you say that okay okay nothing I, I was just checking the same cookie but yeah that's fine if you if you if you saved it in the BPF map then yeah then same cookie will work too yeah. but even you if you save it in the request to create a local storage in the request socket then. Maybe you guys don't have a sync cookie case, so you guys don't enable the sync cookie of syscuttle. Because in, in, in sync cookie mode, there, there won't be a request socket created in the, in the server, right? Yeah, I, I, I forgot if, if we were uh, doing the sync cookie. Or how or when is when we enable it, but yes, like it's it's an interesting uh, approach as well. So I I look also into uh, this BPF helper to to see if I can use this to to save the the sim packet as well and how to to recycle that information. Yeah, um, so mm -hmm. I can see that uh, Eric. Uh, and also Jacob raised his hands. I presume Eric might uh, want to comment on your previous uh, reply from Martin potentially. So let's let's uh, if you could unmute yourself 
first, Eric, and then afterwards, uh, Jacob. Yeah, I am unmuted. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to remind that uh, under SynFlood, we don't have a request socket, so I'm not sure we can extend uh, the request socket to add a local storage because uh, SynFloods are not that uncommon. Even on uh, hosts which are protected, you know, <laughs> in the data center, it's not something that uh, you can rely. There is no way you can have a full um, communication uh, without any sync cookie ever. So it's uh, whatever uh, you come up, you need to have a solution uh, coping with the sync cookie mode as well. So better just do it uh, from from the beginning. Also, uh, I want to point out that under sync flood, uh, if we are really uh, storing stuff in some map and uh, that's that's going to be a stability scalability issue and a performance issue as well okay right. so let's, uh, yeah jacob please go yeah thank you uh so i was just uh wondering uh, if i understood uh correctly uh with your um bpf set socked up program um you've managed to build a replacement for so mark effectively that doesn't require the uh, process to run with cabinet admin is, is that right so Something that we that I I didn't show up in in this presentation is that uh, we also have a permissions check at the C group level, so we are also implementing these uh, special capabilities for these special features, and those are also in BPF. So basically, we when a task is created, we populate these BPF fields as well to control uh, what a user can or can't use. I see, but that's, that sounds uh, finer grained than uh, Cabinet Admin. And yeah, that's a really cool solution. Thanks. Uh, so there was one more question, um, but I think you probably answered it from the chat uh, from Lawrence. Uh, since you mentioned the first SYN, does your scheme work with SYN cookies? If I recall correctly, you don't get the request sock for initial SYN. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so at the end, we ended up like uh, using this global map. So we are actually not working at the request socket level. And also, as, men as Eric mentioned, uh, one of the problems that uh, that is that we have using this approach is that under a sim flood you basically uh, you need to be mindful of your resources so that's why we ended up like having this a uh, uh, lru uh, hash map so basically yes if we if if we are under a sim flood of course we are going to recycle this hash table and of course it's not going to work properly but at least we are not a uh, using more resources than the ones that we are willing to give. And, and also because of this issue, what we do is uh, we created, we load different uh, BPF maps. So each application has a different view and a different uh, LRU map. So if an user is under a sim flood, that doesn't affect uh, separate users uh, that is using this feature as well. Okay, and one more uh, comment from John. Uh, XDPTX more or less would be useful for, for us to do accounting and collect NetApp stats. Looks like a similar use case. 